We can use the new assembly features in Revit 2012 to isolate the building elements that will be fabricated and to create views containing the information needed for fabrication. Let's zoom in on the lobby and atrium of this three-story building and take a look at a few examples. We'll select the Zoom tool and then zoom in on the region at the center of the building. For example, we've designed a custom railing element to be used around the floor openings in the atrium area. This railing uses standard elements for the rails, but uses custom panel elements with openings that will need to be fabricated. Another example is this custom sculptural form that appears in the lobby area. This is a completely custom element, and again, it will need to be fabricated. Let's look at how we can isolate the information needed to fabricate these elements in the Revit environment by using assemblies. We can create a new assembly by selecting the elements which will be included, for example the railing and the panels on each side and then choosing the Create Assembly tool. When we create a new assembly, we'll be asked to give it a name, for example, Custom Atrium Railing. We'll specify that this is for Level 2. And we also choose a naming category. That's the primary category that this new assembly should belong to. And we'll choose Railings as that category for this new assembly. Click OK and a new assembly is created. It appears at the bottom of the project browser in the Assemblies group. For the new assembly, let's create views that will let us document its features. Right-click on the assembly name and choose Create Assembly Views. You'll see this is the default list that will be created. We'll accept all of those for now. Say OK. And you'll see that in the project browser, a list of views has appeared. The ortho view, some detailed views, a plan view, as well as a parts list and a material takeoff. Let's look at how we can add fabrication information to those views. Let me scroll down to the level 3 railing, which I had created earlier, expand that, and we'll take a look at some of those views where I've already added some of the information. This view is currently displaying the panel elements, but not the railings. If I'd like to see those railings also, I can open the visibility graphics and turn on the railings category. Say OK to display those. To make this view easier to understand, I might also want to turn on the hidden line or shaded visual appearance. Let's take a look at some of the other views which were created. We have the section A showing a section cut through the assembly from front to back, and section B which is showing a similar view from side to side. In the plan detail view, we could add information to help explain the size of the components. For example, in this view, I've added dimensions, showing the length of each of the different custom panels, as well as the gaps between them. We can look at the material takeoff, which shows the amount of material required to fabricate the different elements. In this case, I'm isolating just the custom panel elements, and you'll see that 142 square feet of material will be required. We could also look at the parts list, which will show all of the different elements that are included in the assembly, the one railing element and the three different panel elements that are involved. Depending upon the fabrication process that will be used, we could add these views directly to a sheet. For example, pulling in the ortho view, the plan view, and some of the section views to explain to the fabricator what we have in mind. But we'll go one step further. Let's actually use these views to encode the information necessary to drive a laser cutting or water jet cutting machine to fabricate those custom panel elements. Let's duplicate those detailed section views, add information to encode the laser cutting instructions, and filter out any information that isn't necessary for the fabrication machine. We'll select Detail Section A and duplicate that. Let's rename that to Fabrication Section A. Similarly, let's do that for Section B, duplicating the view, then renaming it 
to fabrication section B. For our next step, let's remove the information from this view that won't be used in fabricating the custom panel elements. For example, we can turn off the railing category as well as the section cuts and the detail callout. To do that, let's open the visibility graphics and in the model categories, we'll scroll down and choose to turn off the railings. Then on the annotation categories tab, let's turn off the callouts as well as the sections. Say OK, and let's return to the view, and zoom in on the panel itself. We'll now encode the information about the edges to be cut, and to do that, we'll use a custom line style. On the Manage tab, choose Additional Settings and Line Styles, and we'll create some new line styles. One called Laser Cutting. This one will be set to the thinnest line weight and have a color of red to instruct our laser cutting machine that the line should be cut. We'll also create a second line style called Laser Scoring. For lines that should be engraved on the surface but not cut through, say OK. The instruction for scoring is again the thinnest line weight, but instead using the blue color. Say OK to choose that, and we'll close our line styles. We'll now apply our line styles to the design model, and we can do that in a couple different ways. Let's choose the model, then switch to the Modify tab. We could use the Line Work tool and apply the line style choosing either Laser Cutting or Laser Scoring. We'll use a slightly different technique, though, to add a line that will cross over these bracket elements, and that's to go to the Annotate tab and use Detail Lines. Choosing the Detail Line tool, we can again choose the line style and we'll choose Laser Cutting as the line style we'll use. Then we can draw new lines or pick lines by choosing the edges of the model geometry. Let's use the Pick Lines option. We can easily pick the edges of the custom panel, as well as picking the edges of the cutouts in the panel. For example, for the circle, if I tab, we can select the entire circle. Again, for this one, we'll tab to select the entire circle. That same technique will also work for the big swoopy wave. Hovering first over one of the edges, then tabbing several times to select the entire chain of edges, then clicking to apply detail lines to all those edges. With those detail lines in place, we can now hide the original panel element, leaving only the detail lines in the view. We'll choose that. Then we can right click and say, let's hide that element. And when we do, the original element disappears, leaving only the detail lines. The final step would be to crop this view. Let's turn on the cropping and show the crop boundary. Let me zoom out a bit so we can move that boundary in to the edges and lay these parts out efficiently on a sheet. We can create a view template to make it easy to apply these same settings to other views. We'll switch to the View tab. Use the View Templates pull down and choose Create Template from Current View. We'll call this our Fabrication Sections Template. Say OK to save that away. And now when we create additional views, we can easily apply these same view settings. We'll scroll down and switch to the Fabrication Section A instead. Let's apply that template. Again, choosing the Fabrication Sections template we just created. We're now ready to start applying the detail lines to the cutting surfaces in this view. With the detail lines applied, we can then choose the model element and say hide it, leaving only the detail lines in the view, and finally crop that view to bring the boundaries in closer for efficient placement on the sheet. Creating a new sheet to hold these assembly views is a little bit different than the standard technique. Rather than switching to the View tab and choosing New Sheet here, what we do is select the assembly in the project browser and right-click to say Create Assembly Views 
and then we can choose a new sheet within this dialog. That's because this sheet is special and it will only appear as part of this assembly. We'll choose Sheet, say OK, and now you see a new sheet view appears. Let's rename that to indicate that this will be holding our fabrication views. Say OK. And then we can drag our fabrication views onto the sheet. We'll put the section view A as well as the section view B. And we can continue to add all of the different views that are necessary to be sent to the fabrication machine. Another common fabrication technique that can be used to create scale models or even full-size assemblies is 3D printing. To export our design model for 3D printing, we'll use the STL file format, which is used by 3D printers that use the stereolithography process. To get started, let's switch over to a 3D view of our custom component. We'll use that 3D ortho view that's included as part of our assembly. When using 3D printing, any of the elements that appear in this 3D view will also appear in the 3D printed model. So you'll typically want to filter out any unnecessary elements to simplify your model. To do that, open the visibility graphics overrides for this view. And let's turn off any elements that are unnecessary. We'll start by selecting all and then turning them all off. Then I'll select none and turn on just the railings and the generic models, which contain those custom panel elements. Say OK, and now our view will contain only the railings and the custom panels that we want to 3D print. In order to print this model using the STL file format, we'll need the STL file exporter tool, and you can download a free copy of that tool at this location. Go to stlexporter.sourceforge.net in your web browser and click on the Download STL Exporter for Revit Files link. Click on the Download STL Exporter for Revit 2012.msi link and the file will ask permission to be downloaded to your computer. After you install the STL Exporter tool, it appears on the Add-ins tab under the External Tools. You can choose STL Export, and a dialog opens asking you to specify a few settings for the STL Export. One choice is whether it should be a binary or an ASCII file. This will depend upon the software you're using to work with the STL file, but binary is typically a safe choice. We can also choose whether to include any linked models. In our case, we don't have any, so we'll leave that unchecked. We'll say Save, then navigate to the location where the STL file should be saved and give it a name. For example, Railing 3D Print. Click Save, and the STL file is created for you. Next, you'll typically import the STL file into the software used by your 3D printing machine. For example, ZPrint if you're using a ZCorp 3D printer, or maybe Blender, another 3D program that's sometimes used to manipulate and clean up any small errors in the STL file before printing. Some of the common problems that are typically corrected at this stage include looking for forms that are just too thin to be printed using the limitations of the STL process. These forms need to be thickened before they can be printed. Another common problem is removing any duplicate vertices in the model. And finally, there's the issue of removing any non-manifold points. That's points that appear in your model but that just don't make any sense in the real world. These small errors need to be corrected before the 3D printing can actually take place. If you're curious about what's included in the STL version of your model, you can open it in 3ds Max Design to take a look. Launch the 3ds Max Design application, then open the application menu and choose Import. You can choose the STL file which you've just exported, say Open, click OK to accept the default import settings, then wait as the file is imported. In 3ds Max, you can zoom, pan, or orbit the view to get a better understanding of what's included in the STL version of your model.
or use any of the shading or rendering tools. to get an accurate representation of what will be created by the 3D printer. The sculptural sphere in the building lobby is another example of a custom designed object that can be fabricated from the design model. This object is a little more complicated though. It's built up from four horizontal ring elements and 12 vertical fin elements that must be fabricated as separate pieces and then joined. Let's see how we can create those fabrication instructions within Revit. To start, we've created an assembly containing all of the pieces of the sphere. Let's open that assembly and take a look at the views. There's a 3D ortho view showing all of the different pieces, as well as a series of different views isolating the individual rings as well as the thin elements. To isolate these elements, we've created a series of different section cuts, and for each of those sections, drawn the far clipping in very close so only a single ring is shown. Let's take a look at ring C. We'll start by applying a view template that will hide the elements that we don't want to see in this fabrication view. Switch to the View tab, choose View Templates, and apply a template to the current view we'll apply the Fabrication Details Sphere Ring, which will hide the section cuts. Now we're ready to start adding the cutting instructions. Let's switch to the Annotate tab, choose Detail Lines, and make sure that Laser Cutting is chosen as our line style. Then use the Pick Lines tool, and we'll pick the edges of the ring. This is enough to specify the inner and outer edges of the ring, but we also need to specify the notches that will be cut into the ring to allow the fins and the rings to be joined. Let's zoom in on one of those intersections and create the instructions that will specify the notch. To specify the notches, let's focus on one of the intersections between a ring and a fin element. We'll add lines to our sketch of the ring to cut out a notch that will allow the fin to slide into it. We'll use Detail Lines and the Pick tool, but let's set an offset to create a small gap that will allow the two pieces to slide together easily. The size of the clearance you should leave depends on the materials being used and the tolerances of the fabrication process. For our purposes, let's leave a sixteenth of an inch. We'll pick the two edges of the fin, making sure to offset the line to the outside of the fin, and then we'll draw a perpendicular line to specify the end of the notch. I'd like this notch to be cut leaving about 5 inches of the ring in place, so let's move that perpendicular line to the appropriate location. On the Annotate tab, we can choose the dimensions, and dimension from the line to the inside edge of the ring, and adjust that so that that's leaving 5 inches of the ring in place. With that in place, we can remove the dimension. Next, we'll remove the parts of the cutting lines that aren't necessary, choosing a line, and pulling that in, choosing the upper line, and pulling that in, then zooming out, and adjusting these lines so the back end also lines up with the back of the notch. With those lines drawn, we can now array them around the ring to indicate all of the notches that should be cut. Let's zoom in a little closer. Start by picking those lines We'll tab to grab all three, then use the Array tool. We'll choose a radial array. Let's place the center of rotation right at the center of the rings. We can specify that we want to create 12 different notches, then sweep the angle from the first to the second notch 30 degrees. The array will create 12 notches all the way around the ring. Let's zoom out. And now we can hide the sphere assembly 
in this view, leaving only the lines that will define the fabrication of the ring and the notches. Having specified the inner and outer boundaries and the notches for one of the rings, we're now ready to do that for the other rings. For example, for ring A, B, and D, we can follow similar steps to indicate the boundary lines and notches on those rings. When fabricating mini pieces, it's a good idea to label them. So we can add a piece of text to each of the rings. For example, here I've added the label D to this ring, indicating which part of the overall assembly this is. We've styled this text to appear in blue so that it will be scored onto the surface of the material when the piece is fabricated. We can also follow very similar steps to indicate the boundaries and notches needed for the fin elements. Let's switch to fin 1 and zoom in on one of the notches. You'll see that we've used a similar procedure here, leaving a clearance on both sides of the intersecting elements to give them a bit of space to easily slide together. For the fin elements, we'll cut the notches to the inside so the fin and ring pieces can be interlocked together to form the entire sphere. Let's zoom out so we can see the entire fin. With these detail lines indicating the boundaries and the notches added, we can now hide the original design model. Let's select the sphere, right click, and we can choose to hide this element in the view. Now we'll actually need 12 of these fins so to easily create their profiles, let's select all these detail lines. Then use the Array tool. It will be a linear array. We'll specify that there will be 12 elements needed. And choose to indicate the location of the second element of the array. Let's click on a starting point. Pull over, but stay very close, and place the second copy here. We're placing all of the copies very close so that we can use our material efficiently during production. We can now place all of our fabrication views on a sheet. Let's open a sheet. Where I've already placed those views, lay them out efficiently on the sheet. And this sheet containing all of the fabrication views is now ready to send to our fabricators for production. Although we've been illustrating a 2D fabrication process, we could also use 3D printing to create a scale model of our assembly. To do so, switch to a 3D view, for example, the 3D ortho view, that shows all of the elements and how they are joined in the completed assembly. With the STL exporter installed, we can switch to the add-ins tab, open the external tools pull-down, and choose the STL export add-in. We'll accept the defaults of binary STL format and not including the linked models. Click Save, then name our new file. For example, example, sphere, print. Click Save, and the STL exporter exports all of those pieces to an STL file. We can then open the STL file in our 3D printing software for final cleanup and fabrication using 3D printing.